It's 26 to 8. And back in the early 50s in the UK, a group of groundbreaking psychiatrists provided early evidence that the use of hallucinogenic drugs such as uh, mescaline and LSD had therapeutic potential in the treatment of mental illness. Unfortunately for them, due to the social and political backlash at the time against the growing hippie counterculture of the day, their research was shut down. Fast forward to today, and the use of psychedelic drug alternatives are again being considered with the Therapeutic Goods Administration in Australia set to hand down a decision, albeit a provisional one, on their potential for integration into the modern medical treatment of mental illness. However, the announcement has been tempered somewhat by the Royal Australian and New Zealand College of Psychiatrists, who've warned that their efficacy and indeed safety remains very much and unknown. Dr Stephen Bright is Senior Lecturer in Addiction at Edith Cowan University and founder of the not-for-profit research association PRISM, or Psychedelic Research in Science and Medicine. Stephen, thanks so much for your time. Welcome to Evenings. Thank you for having me. Now, Stephen, how much research has been done into the use of drugs like MDMA or ecstasy or the active ingredient in magic mushrooms as, as treatment options? So, as you mentioned, once these drugs were prohibited, the research stopped. So in 1971, there was pretty much no research conducted. And then over the past 10 years, there's been a psychedelic science renaissance with increasing amounts of research, both looking at the brain science behind it, understanding how psychedelics work on the brain and also clinical trials into the efficacy of the drugs. And so there's been six phase two clinical trials of MDMA-assisted psychotherapy for post-traumatic stress disorder, a phase three clinical trials just being completed and more underway, are underway. And with regard to psilocybin, there is two phase three clinical trials currently underway to look at the role of psilocybin-assisted psychotherapy to treat depression that doesn't respond to current treatment. So that's the one when we're talking about, you know, the old magic mushroom, that's, that's the active ingredient we're talking about. And the, the charity Mind Medicine Australia, that's the organisation who have applied for the drugs to be moved from the prohibited to the controlled substance uh, list. Stephen, and predominantly, what, what areas of treatment? You've, you've mentioned one there, but is, is there a more broad range of treatments that they might be used for? Look, there's emerging evidence that psilocybin might be effective in the treatment of uh, addictive behaviour. So they've looked at tobacco cessation, they've looked at alcohol use. In the US, they've also looked at obsessive compulsive disorder. With MDMA, there's emerging evidence from the US that it might be effective in treating social anxiety among people who experience autism. And there's also been a, a trial in the UK that's looked at people experiencing alcohol use disorder, comorbid with some sort of trauma, being treated with MDMA-assisted psychotherapy. So, Stephen, is there anywhere in the world that is actively using these ingredients in the treatment of mental health? Well, in other countries where this research is, you know, really ramping up, where there's phase three clinical trials underway or even, you know, with MDMA, one that's now been completed in the US, Israel and Canada, obviously it was a multi-site large clinical trial, in those three countries, Canada, US and Israel, because they've done so much research, they have a compassionate access scheme. So people can access these treatments outside of the research. But outside of those three countries, it's not really accessible outside of a research context. And even in those three countries, MDMA and psilocybin are still considered prohibited drugs, mm. so they haven't rescheduled them as medicines just yet. You're with Evenings on ABC Radio Hobart and ABC Northern Tasmania, and I'm talking with Dr Stephen Bright, Senior Lecturer in Addiction at ECU. And Stephen, what, what work does need to be done, in your opinion, to ensure the efficacy and the, and the safety of hallucinogenic drugs as mainstream medical treatments? Well, I think the preliminary evidence is really promising, and... As a consequence, myself and others are involved in establishing research here in Australia and I think for us to be able to integrate this into the Australian mainstream medical system, we need to first complete that research to demonstrate that we can do it safely here in Australia, even if we're not demonstrating that we can do it effectively um, because that research is happening across the world in large 
uh, phase three clinical trials. But I do think we need to demonstrate that we can do it safely, that we have the people, we have the infrastructure. And in doing so, all of the research that's happening at the moment in Australia is occurring in collaboration with hospitals. I think we need to ensure that our healthcare system is set up in a way to be able to provide these therapies because this isn't like medical cannabis. You don't give somebody a prescription and send them home to take it. It's integrated within the context of psychotherapy that might occur over 12 or 18 weeks and there's only two or three drug-assisted sessions that happen in the hospital setting and last somewhere between six and eight hours. So um, playing devil's advocate here, as, as a psychologist working in the field of, of um, alcohol and other addictions, as you do, are there any concerns around the addictive nature of the substances being considered as treatment options? Look, I would be more concerned actually with existing treatments such as antidepressant medication. People taking antidepressant medication, if they suddenly cease taking it, experience something that psychiatry calls discontinuation syndrome, which is just a fancy word for withdrawal. With the classic psychedelic substances like psilocybin, LSD, there's very little evidence of acute toxicity and there's no evidence of sort of it having an addictive tendency. So people don't become dependent on it. They don't seek out the drug afterwards. And it's even got a safety mechanism built into it called tachyphylaxis. So if you take some mushrooms today, if you try taking some LSD tomorrow, it actually won't work. You have to give it a couple of days before the drug will actually work again. So realistically, Stephen, what sort of time frame would we be looking at before these currently prohibited drugs um, are admitted into mainstream use? This is, you know, hypothetically, that the Therapeutic Goods, uh, Goods Administration in Australia um, does give the provisional tick of approval. So I'm not sure that the TGA will give it the tick of approval. I think the application's been made a little bit prematurely. Those things that I talked about, such as um, ensuring that you know our healthcare system is set up, ensuring that we have therapists that are trained, ensuring that there's an accredited program with the Royal Australian New Zealand College of Psychiatry. I think all of these things need to be put in place first. And so I think maybe it might be another year or two until... Uh, the TGA would consider approving this as a medicine within Australia and then it would take a few years after that for us to be able to integrate that because even after the TGA makes a decision, it takes a little while for that decision to be implemented. Dr Stephen Bright, thank you so much. Fascinating conversation and, um, yeah, it's, a, it's another one of those watch this space. Thank you for your time. It's appreciated. Thanks for having me. Dr. Stephen Bright, Senior Lecturer uh, in Addiction at Edith Cowan University. And, of course, uh, that uh, decision, if it's made one way or the other, uh, is expected to be handed down as early as next week. It's 18 to 8. You're with Evenings on ABC Radio Hobart and ABC Northern Tasmania.